thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Ruth Hayes, I'll be chairing this afternoon. Welcome to this event and many thanks for joining us to discuss why socialists can't leave Labour to the centrists and should unite to build resistance to the Tories. This has been organised by Labour Outlook, which is a fast growing website, bringing you daily news and views from Labour's left and those at the forefront of resisting the Tories. Over the past decade and a half in particular, there's been a huge upheaval in the world, in Britain and in the Labour Party. To be an activist in the Labour movement and the wider left has been a roller coaster of emotions and activity, political highs and lows. And in the past year, that of course has all taken place in the midst of a global pandemic that because of our government's actions has left over 120,000 dead in the UK, the worst death rate in the world currently calculated. It's throwing us ever deeper into economic unemployment and social crises with the existential threat of climate breakdown growing. In the midst of this, and because of the ending of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party, there's been a resurfacing of the discussion about the value of organising within the Labour Party. I'm really excited by today's event. And so to discuss this today, we're joined by Steve Howell, who was Deputy Director of Strategy and Communications for Jeremy in 2017, and is also the author of Game Changer about that dramatic 2017 general election campaign. He'll be giving an extended contribution, then there'll be a short contribution from Matt Wilgris of Labour Outlook. Um, we want to have as many questions and comments from the audience as possible, but because of the size of the audience today with over 600 people registered in advance, uh, we've got a team of volunteers who are gonna be facilitating this uh, through the Q&A function in Zoom rather than the chat function. So please do post your comments and questions to the speakers in the Q&A function, and then we'll have time for a few rounds of questions from the audience after we've heard from our speakers. Also, just a reminder that during the event, you can tweet um, at Labour Outlook uh, to uh, share your insights and reactions to what's being said. So without further ado, I'll move to our first speaker, Steve Harrell. Oh, Steve, I think you're muted. At the yes, moment. I am. I'm all right now. OK, <laughs> there had to be a there had to be a hitch, didn't there? Uh, thank you very much, Ruth. And thank you, Labour Outlook, for, for inviting me. Um, for want of a better place to start, I'm going to start a, a Sir Keir Starmer's speech on uh, Thursday. I, I don't know about anybody else, but I had a touch of uh, deja vu on Thursday. Here was a a Labour leader talking in glowing, completely uncritical terms about business. And on the same day, uh, I saw that Barclays had announced obscene bonuses for its top bankers. And I, I thought for a moment I'd been transported back into 2008. Uh, Barclays' uh, bonus pot is £1.6 billion pounds, uh, for, the, uh, for the year. Uh, and it will give uh, its top bankers, several hundred of them, an average payout of £636,000 each. And that's within the bonus cap that the government is reported to be considering lifting. So that's, that's what you get when there's a bonus cap. Um, now, as for Keir Starmer's speech, frankly, there was so little substance in it um, that the point of making it is a little bit of a mystery. He, he accused the Tories of an ideology that's indifferent, I quote, to the moral an economic necessity of tackling inequality, uh, fair enough. Uh, and he said, we have to go forward to a future that looks utterly unlike the insecure and unequal economy that's been so cruelly exposed by the virus, All, also fair enough, it's promising so far. But not a word from him or any front bencher about the bank bonuses, um, and hardly anything very specific on anything, frankly. Um, now, I'm sure that we can all agree uh, that the future should be utterly unlike the past, given how bad the last so many years have been um, and, and how bad things are at the moment. Uh, but exactly how is that going to be achieved? Keir Starmer says that for too long, and this is, I think, a, a swipe at 
John McDonnell and uh, Jeremy Corbyn, and, and a very unjust swipe, by the way, because actually they did a hell of a lot to develop policy in relation to uh, business. Uh, but for too long, Labour, he said, have failed to realise that the only way to deliver social justice and equality is through a strong partnership with business. The only way? Uh, think about those words, the only way. Not through progressive taxation then, not maybe through a wealth tax, not by restoring corporation and capital gains taxes, at least to the level that they were set uh, under to Tony Blair, which was the policy uh, in the 2017 and 2019 manifestos, not by strengthening trade union rights and trade union bargaining, uh, definitely not, presumably, by expanding public ownership uh, and having more of the economy run for need rather than greed. Instead, apparently, it would be through some kind of vague partnership in presumably much the same way as Theresa May's war on plastic was a completely voluntary partnership, had no legal force. Uh, lots of fine words, but the plastic keeps piling up. We know very well from decades uh, of neoliberalism that sucking up to big business uh, might deliver a future unlike the past, but only in the sense that things get worse, not that they get better. Uh, we know that left to its own devices, business will pursue profits relentlessly because that's what the system is designed to do. The capital flows go to where the profits are greatest and the shareholders will demand their dividends. So when George Osborne slashed corporation tax uh, for big business dramatically from 28% uh, to 18%, he said it would lead to an investment boom, but it didn't. Dividends paid out annually to the FTSE 100 company shareholders doubled from £45 billion a year in 2010 to more than £90 billion by 2019. Now, I don't blame Keir Starmer for not wanting to be specific on everything, to spell out every detail of his possible 2024 manifesto at this stage. Uh, but he does need to tell a story. And at the very least, he needs to explain that a Labour government will expect its relationship with business to be a two-way street. Because greater equality is never going to happen through a love fest with bankers and billionaires. Now, Keir Starmer's lacklustre leadership hasn't surprised many of us, I expect, on this, uh, on, on this uh, call today. But it's obviously come as a huge disappointment to quite a number of those co former Corbyn supporters who were persuaded and to vote for him, who genuinely believed that he was sincere in his 10 pledges. The big clue at the time was the way that he hid the identity of his donors. And you only have to look now at the names of those on that donor list, and I won't go through it now because there isn't time, to realise he's a captive uh, of a small group of Blairites. And they're undoubtedly calling the shots. Former Blair advisor John McTernan spelt it out last April in an article where he said, there's no problem with a witch hunt when there really are witches. He told Starmer, act ruthlessly, punish the losers and ignore party members. And that's, of course, exactly what he did in suspending Jeremy uh, Corbyn from party membership. Uh, but of course, he actually overreached because the party then reinstated Jeremy, which left Starmer looking foolish. And that then prompted him to resort to the vindictive action of suspending Jeremy from the parliamentary party. So we now have the absurd situation where Jeremy is a party member, uh, but deprived of the whip by a rogue PLP. It's the PLP that's defied the party, yet the General Secretary, whose salary we pay, bans any discussion on the issue and suspends CLP officers if they allow it. It's undemocratic, it's unconstitutional, in my opinion, and it's made all of us very angry and frustrated. I have uh, several close friends who've been suspended, like tens of thousands of members. I'm fuming at the treatment of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, by Keir Starmer, the very shabby treatment. Jeremy said he regretted uh, that dealing with anti-Semitism cases had taken longer than he would have liked. He said that one case of anti-Semitism is one case too many. He supported the recommendations of the EHRC and he's called for their implementation. And a panel properly constituted by the party has accepted that. 
yet the whip's been suspended, while no action has been taken against the people who siphoned party money off without proper authorization to a secret election operation in 2017. All of it is sickening and a disgrace, but we can't afford to let emotion get the better of our political judgment. Jeremy wouldn't want that. The millions of people suffering in the worst economic crisis for 300 years, in a country with the highest COVID death toll, the millions who need a strong and united Labour movement fighting back against the Tories, they need us to stay united and they need us to act with wisdom and maturity. A friend of mine is uh, fond of saying that revenge is a dish best served cold. Well, revenge isn't necessarily the word I would choose in this context, but there will be a political reckoning. The only issue is how soon can we make it happen? The part is not the personal property of Keir Starmer, nor is it the property of the PLP. And it's definitely not the property of a clique of wealthy Blairites. It belongs to its members in the branches and in the affiliated trade unions. It's the Labour Party's mass working class base that makes it unique. There's literally no other party in the world like it. None of the social democratic parties in Europe are based on the trade unions in the way that the Labour Party is. There's no party like the Labour Party anywhere. The other day, uh, a Twitter friend uh, said, Stam was trying to remodel the party in the image of Macron's en marche in France, centrist, technocratic and neoliberalism. Now, I'm sure that's what uh, probably he, he, he wants to do, and, and certainly many of the Blairites who are, who are backing him. Uh, and that was also New Labour's project. But sooner or later, it runs into the problem of this mass base that the party has. Uh, Blair, Blairism ran, ran up against the interests of those the party was formed to represent. Um, and that's all the more the case now in the worst crisis most of us uh, have ever known. What the Blair year showed uh, was that you can capture the leadership, but you, def you, you can't indefinitely get round the fact that the party is a creature of its mass base. And Blair had the advantage of highly favourable economic conditions throughout his leadership. The circumstances now cry out for the transformative agenda expressed in the two Corbyn manifestos. That's why Keir Starmer had to pretend to believe in those 10 pledges. Um, and that's also why opposition to Starmer has surfaced much more swiftly and strongly than with Blair. Blair, Blair had nearly 10 years of honeymoon before the opposition to him really surfaced. In opposition for nearly five years and then well into his uh, time, uh, really up until the Iraq war, the honeymoon uh, lasted, I would argue. Um, but in the case of Keir Starmer, that uh, frustration and opposition is surfacing very quickly because of the nature of the situation we're in and the needs of the time. Uh, and that opposition was shown in the NEC and the Young Labour elections in October. It's been shown in the resolutions passed by dozens and dozens uh, of uh, constituency parties. It's in, been shown in the joint statements of eight unions supporting Jeremy, two of which were unions that nominated uh, Keir Starmer. Um, and it's been shown also in the scathing article by Tom Cabassi, a key Starmer supporter earlier this week. And I think it will be shown uh, in a big way potentially when Keir Starmer finally has to face a party conference. Um, which I don't know whether it'll be this year or not in the circumstances, but sooner or later, he has to face uh, the party at a conference. Uh, now, I know that some people say, why don't the unions just uh, cut off their funding and decamp to another party? But it's not as simple as that. And I'm sure Ruth, being a, an EC member of Unite, will bear, bear this out. Um, each union is a democratic organisation in its own right. Um, and... and you know, there's, it has decision-making processes and it can't, it's not a matter of one or two people saying, right, we're off. We're going to go here or there and, and, and join this or that rival party. Um, at the height of the dissatisfaction with Blair, only three unions disaffiliated and two of them have now come back. Um, even if one or two unions disaffiliated again, where would they go? 
they wouldn't necessarily link up with the same uh, organization outside the party. Over the last 120 years since the Labour Party was uh, formed, left-wing groups outside the Labour Party, whether by choice, uh, whether they're outside by choice or whether excluded against their wishes, haven't prospered. Uh, if they've had any impact at all, it hasn't lasted very long. Now, there must be, at the moment, a dozen or so groups that are eagerly encouraging Labour members to lead, leave. Each has its uh, own stall, its own uh, position, its own brand of socialism, but none has the capacity to unite the coalition that supported uh, Jeremy. Even if a large proportion of the 120 or thousand or so who voted for Rebecca Long Bailey were to join one or other of these breakaways, uh, they'd still only, each of them would still only have a few thousand uh, members, uh, two or three thousand perhaps at most. Very cosy, uh, but far from enough uh, to be viable. Um, and that's without allowing for people who might drift into the Greens or not join any, any party. Our best chance of advancing the politics that Jeremy stands for is by sticking together and by continuing the fight for those politics within the party and building mass movements around those policies beyond the party. Scattering in a dozen different directions will only make the achievement of real change harder, in my opinion. Um, and inevitably, it would also focus more attention on, our, on, on the differences between people by forcing them to decide between these competing groups rather than on the things that unite us. That's not to say we shouldn't discuss differences between us. We do need debate and discussion. Um, the Corbyn project was never an ideological project. It was never ideologically cohesive. It was a diverse coalition that came together around immediate goals, particularly opposition to austerity, opposition to regime change wars, the war in Iraq, and in general, uh, opposition to neoliberalism in a sort of general sense. Um, one of the reasons the Corbyn project floundered uh, after 2017 is because that coalition was divided over Brexit. It was a division that reflected different views about how to unite the working class, about whether or not the EU, which I think most of us agreed was neoliberal, could ever be reformed. Um, and there are plenty of other issues like that that need discussion. So we have to have those discussions, there's no question about it, but not in a way that fragments and weakens the left. We can have those discussions and that debate while remaining within the party and drawing the wider membership of our unions and our party branches into that discussion uh, as well. Jeremy was elected uh, on a largely spontaneous wave of anger about austerity. He was suddenly catapulted into the leadership with a hostile party machine and PLP trying to thwart him and with no real infrastructure to support to support him. And I know very well what it was like because I was in the leader's office and it felt like we were under siege. Um, now, over the last five years, while we haven't achieved as much as any of us would have liked by any means, the left has become much more organised and created a whole number of assets that will stand us in good stead as we go forward. Momentum didn't exist five years ago. There are now nearly twice as many left MPs as there were five years ago, including some very talented young left MPs like Zara Sultana and Bel Ribeiro Adi. Tribune has been re-established and now has 15,000 plus subscribers. Socialist TV has been launched. No Holding Back has been launched. Navara Media has developed and become stronger. The Morning Star, a very old uh, newspaper, has, uh, ha has also become stronger. The organiser of this event, Labour Outlook, is doing a great job pumping out useful stuff uh, to the movement. Now we've got Jeremy's own peace and justice project working on the issues that were central to his leadership. Uh, and then beyond uh, those specifically left projects, there are broad movements working on uh, single issues, ACORN fighting for renters, unions fighting fire and rehire, Black Lives Matter, uh, campaigns against the Spycott Bill, Labour for a Green New Deal, uh, People's Assembly, CND, etc. I mean, there are just a lot of uh, organisations out there doing a great job on these single issues that uh, bring in people outside the Labour Party as well, of course, but around which within the Labour Party we can mobilise uh, support. Uh, these campaigns need to be built for their own sake. 
Uh, I'm not saying we should colonize them, but um, the degree to which we're able to build these campaigns and build this left organization, these uh, momentum and other uh, uh, things like Tribune and Labour Outlook and so on, uh, to the degree we're able to do that, uh, we'll be able to transform the political landscape, landscape uh, and see that kind of upsurge uh, in political activity uh, that led in the first place to Corbyn's uh, election as, as, as leader. Um, so I just want to finish on this. Bernie Sanders was always very clear that his two presidential campaigns weren't an end in themselves, just as Jeremy's leadership uh, wasn't an end in itself. They were about being a catalyst uh, to encourage people to organize. They were about creating a movement. In the United States, Sanders has left a legacy of our revolution, Justice Democrats, a very large now Democratic Socialist um, Association. Socialists, people who declare themselves socialists in Congress for the first time. Um, and, and it's the same here. I think we've achieved a lot in these Corbyn years. We've built these assets I, I was talking about. We've built movements and we need to continue that uh, process. We need to build a movement that's so strong that no amount of right-wing shenanigans or media hostility can defeat it. I think we've achieved a remarkable amount. Don't let anyone provoke us into throwing it away. Let's keep building. Thank you so much, Steve. That was fantastic, really inspiring. Um, and um, very, very interesting. And I think um, I've certainly seen within the trade union movement in the last sort of couple of years, new younger members wanting to get organised in their workplace, taking up issues exactly as you're saying. So thank you, that was um, brilliant. Um, and I've also got an announcement that we're being joined now by nearly 700 people across all our streams, which I think is probably further evidence of what you're saying, that, that there is a large, you know, there is a large activist base and we should be looking to think about how we work across. Uh, we've got people um, over 300 people on Zoom. We've got people coming from Oldham, Bristol, Sheffield, York, Wiltshire, Plymouth, London, Northampton, Salisbury, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Swansea, Somerset, Dorset, and Nottingham. So a really fantastic uh, range of um, people joining us today. Uh, we're going to have a very brief contribution now from Amy Smith, who is a Labour Outlook contributor, who's going to just tell you a little bit more about Labour Outlook. Uh, thanks so much, Ruth, um, and thanks everybody for joining us today. It is so great um, to hear we've got over 700 people listening and from all around the country as well. And I spotted somebody from France too, so that's amazing that we've got international. Uh, so I'm just going to talk for a moment briefly about um, Labour Outlook, which is organising and hosting this event today. Um, so if you're not familiar with Labour Outlook yet, um, they are a news and comment website that seeks to publish the best of the left's ideas. Um, so we at Labour Outlook are always looking for positive ways forward um, in response to pressing problems and also longer term political, societal and economic issues. Um, and Labour Outlook seeks to bring together um, some writing from some of the left's most foremost um, thinkers and figures in the UK today. Uh, we cover a really broad range of topics. So we've got um, recent um, pieces on Latin American politics, Labour Party democracy, COVID-19, as you'd expect lots on that, and support for workers and the zero COVID strategy, and also different ways that we can um, build the fight back against the Tories. Uh, some of our regular columnists include a vast number of MPs, including Richard Bergen, John Trickett, and Apsana Begum. And we've also got some great articles from other people within the party and the movement. Um, some good examples recently include a piece on the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign by Chris Peace, um, support for workers during COVID-19 by Roxana Fias, and um, a piece by uh, Mish Rahman um, on the NEC about Labour's internal structures and the inclusion of BAME members. Um, so we also host a lot of forums like this. Um, we host them to discuss the best ideas of the left and talk about topics that aren't always covered in other sections of the movement or in the media. Um, our next forum is on April 24th. It's Why Socialists Are Anti-Imperialists with Andrew Murray, uh, who's the founder of the Stop the War Coalition. And there is an Eventbrite link which will be posted in the chat box. Please register and join us on that. 
And events like this are, are costly to um, host. We do have to pay Zoom something to do this. So to keep holding them and, and building our movements um, and sharing and debating these ideas, we need your support. So um, please, comrades, if you are able to, donate to Labour Outlook through the PayPal link, which is being shared in the chat box as well. And uh, keep building us as well, support us through following us on Twitter and Facebook. The links are in the, the Q&As and the chats. Uh, so that's it from me. Uh, thank you again for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event today. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was brilliant, Amy. Um, and then our final speaker is Matt Wilgris, who's one of the founders of Labour Outlook. Uh, he'll make a short contribution and just a reminder, if you haven't yet done so, but you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A function in Zoom and we will be able to take some questions uh, to our speakers later. Thank you, over to you, Matt. Thanks, Ruth, um, and thanks, Amy, and thanks, Steve. Um, it's a real pleasure to speak at this forum and thanks to all the volunteers who've made it happen. Um, as some of you know, people who know me might know I've been struggling a bit with sort of long COVID symptoms so the help of all the volunteers is really appreciated. It's a great turnout today. Um, the topic that we're discussing has um, two, two elements to it as Steve mentioned both why socialists don't abandon labour to the centrists and why we need to unite to build resistance against the Tories and I suppose my central point and which I hope is reflected on the work that Labour Outlook is doing is that this socialist work inside Labour and building these movements of resistance are complementary, not counterposed. Um, as Tony Benn always argued, they are both essential and they can actually be mutually reinforcing. Um, so we're not here today arguing for a kind of heads down in the Labour Party and approach of resolutionary socialism, as some call it. Um, and hopefully it goes without saying that we mustn't let our politics be limited to the perimeter set by Labour's current leadership or indeed by the broader political establishment which they are so keen to be welcomed by. Um, we need to be unashamedly arguing for socialism and an end to this rotten capitalist and imperialist system which is failing people and planet as so obviously illustrated here and in other countries during the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, this, as Steve mentioned, the discussion we're having about Labour is a historically recurring discussion, partly because as Tony Benn used to put it, Labour has always been a party with socialists in it, but not a socialist party. Um, and I think that point is actually really worth in understanding because I think sometimes there is a kind of myth about what the Labour Party has been like at certain stages in the past, which isn't actually true in terms of it. You know, people sort of, look, as is inevitable, you look back on better days, but perhaps sometimes bedwash certain things. Um, so over its history, despite shifts leftwards and rightwards, and indeed, as Steve also referred to, the new Labour attempts to change it, the fundamental nature of the Labour Party, its unique nature based on the trade union link, as Steve has outlined, has remained the same. Lenin termed this sort of contradictory party a bourgeois workers' party, and I think we can still, that still has a quite useful insight to the contradictions we see in our movement and party today. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the historical examples of people's attempts to break from Labour, just to say there is a quite interesting article on Labour Outlook today by Richard Price about the ILP, um, which is a long time ago in the 30s, but it was perhaps the biggest ever left group that left Labour, but actually ended up returning to it much smaller and diminished a decade later. But I would say that even in the time I've been active, a lot of new parties have come and gone and campaigns for new parties have come and gone, and none has reached the size or impact of the Labour left at any of those points, and certainly not the size and impact of the Labour left currently. Um, and even if we do leave Labour, or people do leave Labour, as not all the left would, and as Steve mentioned, not a number of trade unions probably wouldn't, the question of how to relate to the Labour Party and the left within the Labour Party would actually still remain unanswered. Um, so what positively should we be saying and doing? Not only, as I've said, can we be active in Labour and in vital parts of the existence, I think it's essential that we are and that we don't limit our activity to one area or another. That could be local campaigns, community mobilisations, workplace and trade union actions, including supporting industrial action and strikes, anti-racist and international solidarity campaigns, and so on. Um, we've seen in recent years the climate justice explosion and the Black Lives Matter sort of global uprising. And I think we can expect more of these movements to arrive and arise in the years ahead. And whether Keir Starmer deigns to give his blessing or not, 
to things like the Black Lives Matter movement won't stop them mobilising and arriving on the scene. And this brings me to a central point. I think we on the left need to be ambitious. And I think we need on the left need to lead when others won't. We can't wait or just be passively waiting or reacting to things that just reacted, react to things as they happen. We need to be setting out our agenda. We need to be setting out socialist solutions to the health, economic and climate crises we face. Um, in terms of some of the practical work that different people are doing, just to give some sort of examples of things I'm involved with to help um, guide the discussion, I'm sure there's plenty of other examples that could be given. In the Labour Assembly Against Austerity, we've been trying to take this approach of being more sort of proactive in leading things where we can be. So people might have seen through the People's Plan, which has been supported by 20,000 Labour members and numerous MPs. That has started a real discussion around a number of events, articles and so on, on a programme to transition to a better economy with full employment. And then there's also things like single issue campaigns. So it was sort of, we felt that the Labour leadership, whilst formally opposing the government's plan to cut universal credit, £20 a few months ago wasn't making much noise on it at that point. So we didn't sort of wait around to see what Labour was doing. We launched our own petition, which has now had over 35,000 signatures, seen it and received national media coverage. And I personally think influenced the Labour Party taking a more proactive approach on social media and elsewhere on this issue. And this is an issue where the government has done a partial u turn or is about to, it looks like. I don't think it's formal yet. And I think we need to see this as a government that can be forced into youth and concessions. And that's why we need to be more combative and forcing more issues on the agenda because they are weak on those issues. And alongside this, I think it's a real priority and something that perhaps we didn't do enough of in the last five years to engage in a battle of ideas and political education ourselves. And obviously, Labour Outlook is linked to Arise, a festival of Labour left ideas, and there's other vehicles as well doing work on this matter. Um, in terms of the current situation inside Labour, which perhaps we'll cover more in the questions. I think it's important to recognise, as Steve mentioned, that there are already struggles going on inside Labour, locally, regionally, nationally, and that there's little doubt that these struggles will intensify. I think we need to have perspective that developments outside the Labour Party, as well as directly offered in Parliament and inside it, also affect the struggles in the Labour Party. I think we started to see this happen with the National Education Union campaign um, around schools reopening and safe communities and the pressure that was being put on Long line after Rebecca Long Bailey was removed on that issue. That, and that's just one example that's just come up. But I think, you know, people are going to struggle. There, there's a big crisis and people will be responding and all of these things will be reflected in the Labour Party um, and also, of course, within the trade unions. And I think this is especially the case when we, when we acknowledge that we're in this time of big crises, as I mentioned. I think things can and will change much quicker than we might think. And sometimes they can change quite dramatically and even unexpectedly. What does that mean for us as socialists? I think it means, means we need to be ready, we need to be organised, and we need to actively seek out opportunities to join together in struggle and for social solutions. Our duty to keep struggling even when the going gets tough and prepare the ground for what will come afterwards. And that means using every lever and vehicle we possibly can and engaging in every struggle against the now historically redundant capitalist class, its domination and its ideology in and beyond Labour. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you very much. That that was great, Matt. And um, I think two really interesting contributions um, and a lot of food for thought. Just to remind people, um, it's obviously great to get people's thoughts in the Q&A. Um, we have got a great opportunity to ask both Steve and Matt questions. So if you've got something that's a question rather than a contribution, do feel free to put that in, we, we want a debate about what some of the solutions might be. Um, we're taking the questions in kind of a, in groups, if that's okay. So I'll read some questions, we'll go to Steve and then if Matt's got anything to add. Uh, so a number of people are saying they feel disillusioned. And I think, I'm sure, I think Steve said in his contribution, you know, we, we need to be careful not to let our emotions overtake our better judgment. Uh, and I think that it's very understandable that people would feel disillusioned. So people are asking what they can best do, how can they best organise? Uh, Ian Duckett says, you know, members are feeling powerless and outnumbered, so what, what can they do? Others have asked, what are the campaigns we should prioritise building in to our local parties? How do we best make links with the movements and campaigns that people have already mentioned? to ensure that left voices are heard within and outside of the party. 
Uh, and then a final part in this section from Ben C.H. Uh, how can we help those who became politically engaged, often for the first time, I think, uh, in the last five years, to understand that despite a series of bruising defeats, socialist politics has a bigger mass base in Britain than it has had in decades, thanks to work in the party. And again, I think that picks up on some of the points Steve made and certainly reflecting myself, we are in a very different position than before Jeremy's leadership started. So quite a bit to get going with there. So over to you, Steve, first. Okay, well, there's no magic wand on these things. I mean, I, I do understand why people feel frustrated. Some people feel disillusioned and so on. And it's easy for me. I mean, I've been, I've, I, I've been politically active for 50 years and, uh, and, and I've had my spells of feeling frustrated and disillusioned. I feel actually quite uh, upbeat at the moment because I think, of, I mean, the 2019 defeat was a terrible blow. Uh, I worked on that campaign for four or five weeks. I wasn't, I came back in to help with the campaign. And, uh, and it was such a difficult situation because of the split over Brexit um, and a bad defeat. And, and I've been pleasantly surprised at how quickly the left has kind of regrouped and come back. And um, pleasantly surprised, for example, by the vote in the NEC elections uh, in, in the autumn and the young Labour elections. I'm immensely encouraged by how many young people there are who've got the bit between their teeth and who who do see it as a commitment. Where you know, it's the classic, it's a bit of a cliche, but we're in a marathon, not a sprint. And I think with that in mind, I think people have got to look after themselves. Um, you know, they've got to judge themselves. And if they find it immensely stressful going to unpleasant meetings with people who are being unpleasant to them, then I can well understand that. And probably they need to have a bit of a break from that and do something that's a bit more positive um, uh, in, in a campaign. Um, I'm not saying people should pull out of the battle in the party, because I think the battle in the party is terrifically important, but it's not, as Matt was saying, it's not the be all and end all. We mustn't be so preoccupied with the battle in the party that we're not doing the other broader things that build the movement that ultimately is going to really change politics in, in this country. Now, um, someone uh, asked the question alongside that about what campaigns you would prioritize. And I think, Nationally, there's going to be some, you know, there's going to be some biggies. I, I would always prioritise the struggle for peace and the struggle against war. And I think at the moment there is a, a trend, a dangerous trend towards uh, military build-up, uh, escalating tensions with uh, China and Russia. And it doesn't matter what you think of those two countries. The fact is this is very, very dangerous. And... Uh, in the paper only today, I read that in 1983, um, it's only just come out that in 1983, um, there was a, uh, the, the NATO countries simulated a nuclear first strike against the Soviet Union. And because the Soviet Union was so jumpy about that simulation, they then scrambled 100 nuclear bombers. And we were in 1983 perilously close to a nuclear war. And in fact, the term nuclear war, by the way, is a complete misnomer because there, there can't be a nuclear war. There can only be a nuclear holocaust because any exchange of nuclear weapons would effectively destroy the planet. So I would always prioritize the campaign for peace and I would urge people to get involved in Stop the War and CND. But, but, and, and of course, there are all the economic battles if you're in a union. Uh, on wages, if you're a renter, the renters movement, so on. I know in Cardiff, for example, uh, the uh, Momentum members in Cardiff have been very active in getting ACORN set up. So I think it's a case of, of what works locally. Uh, there'll be the big national campaigns, uh, but then, you know, in your area, what is an issue that's galvanising people? Uh, and, 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 and who are your peers and contacts and what are they into and can you find the right people to work with? I mean, I was pleasantly surprised now I've moved to the backwater of Welshpool uh, to, to find that there was a Black Lives Matter protest in Wel Welshpool. I would never have predicted it, but, you know, hugely uh, pleasantly surprised. So I think you've got to, you know, you've got to look at what, uh, what works locally. Um, 
How can we make sure socialism has a bigger mass base? I think it's very important that we uh, always work. You never stop learning. I certainly never stop learning. You know, I'm always keen to participate in discussions, read new stuff, uh, look at what people have got to say. And I think that if it's difficult to get that political education through the Labour Party, you can always do it informally uh, with like minded people locally, set up reading groups, uh, organise little discussions. No one can stop you doing that. And, and I think it's important that people do do that kind of thing. And we all educate ourselves in the politics of socialism uh, and, and build up, if you like, uh, a, a big uh, number of people uh, who, who have got that depth of politics. And that will help sustain. Uh, I know that over the years, uh, the, the, the education I got as a young activist has helped sustain me through the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of, of politics. I hope that answers the questions. I, I tried to touch on all of them. Thank you very much. That was very comprehensive. Um, and certainly I think um, one of the benefits of having a lot of things online is the education that was previously very difficult to get to, especially if you didn't live near uh, a kind of centre is now much more accessible and I know a number of unions and other organisations are, are putting courses online. Matt, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, just a few quick points. Um, in terms of, I think uh, Steve made a point which I remember like the first CLP I was active in was very left and I would sort of didn't understand why anyone wouldn't be active in the CLP, it was seemed pretty good to me. And then like I moved to a different one and it was, the MP was pretty awful. Um, she left the Labour Party in the end, and it was, um, wasn't was easy, but it did actually, as the Blair, first years of the Blair project went on, it did move a bit to the left, and I think later became a quite sort of um, hard left CLP and, and selected Lisa Ford as its BPC, so things do change, but I get, I think also we should be honest, like if people are completely banging their head against the brick wall in their board meeting, then I don't think it's our place people to tell them that they should keep banging their head against the brick wall. Um, in terms of the issues we should be bringing into the party though when we can on emotions and other things, I think there are sort of certain issues that are starting to become clearer where we can really maximise building up pressure and sort of national movements and some of these will be internal party issues like around the Ford inquiry and why it hasn't been published and this work that people did around the sort of diktat on Make to queue on what can be discussed or not. But I think there are also political issues where we feel that the lead, this new leadership line is either inadequate or is a sort of retreat. And often I think the retreat is done under the radar rather than someone get front bench getting up and saying, we're now changing our position on ABC. Um, so, for example, I think, again, the, work, the emotion and the open letter and stuff done around how the leadership responded to the NEU's demands on education, I think was very effective. And that was really building up. And obviously then schools were shut, so it stopped. But you could really feel that building up. And it starts to influence bits of the PLP and bits of structures you might not expect, councillors and so on, sort of breaking on that. And I think there, there are other issues where you, we really need to be trying to create that pressure. So, for example, we need to be talking about Palestine. I think it's a real trap that our opponents try to stop the discussion about Palestine primarily being about Palestine. They want it to be discussed on other other terrains than the human rights and the illegal occupation as defined under international. So I think the Labour and Palestine model motion, which maybe someone could post a link in, in the chat, which started being passed by some CLPs about reaffirming the party's current policy as passed at 2018 and 19 conferences on Palestine, saying it would be against any future illegal annexation and drawing attention to the way Palestinians are being treated around the vaccine and other issues in the COVID crisis. I think that's the kind of motion we should be passing because we're on a strong ground there it's about a clear issue and it's about putting pressure and defending a line a battle line that we have um so i think more things like that the left collection needs to be thinking about that including ourselves in labor outlook and associated organizations like la and arise we need to be thinking more about what are these motions that we can get sort of passed they're amended but passed here there and everywhere not just at conference time that it's like it also enables a discussion on these issues and also, I think of the kind of issue where people who voted for Starmer, who supported Jeremy before, but then voted for Starmer, may or may not have voted for the Grassroots Alliance and the NEC, will feel we can win their support on as well. So I think that's one point. Um, another thing I think is another issue is the sort of 
genuine, I think, concerns from certain parts of the party about where things are going in terms of their structures and rights. So we saw the attempt of Young Labour to be kind of to condemn Young Labour for taking its own decision on whether Jeremy should be reinstated or not for posting a position where the Democratic agreed. Now that's a that's a constitutional part of the Labour Party. They came, they had elections very recently where they elected well, which I think is something we should all remember how well they left it in this young Labour election is very significant. Um, and then they were sort of basically told to not post it and so on. So I think we need to keep an eye on that one as one of the examples, actually. I mean, it could come under further attack and what we need solidarity with. And there are other things as well, like, that started to come through, like, you see it all the time, the great concern, like, so many black socialists leaving our party. Um, and, you know, a totally different approach on so many issues we saw around the Black Lives Matter movement. But also, I think, in trying to sort of maybe stop the new BAME Labour alive before it's even started so I think those issues we need to be very need to be looking at issues that are arising as well as at, at the same time also pushing our agenda politically I think if we get too caught just on organizational matters sometimes that will weaken it thank you very much indeed um really interesting answers and the next round of questions are kind of um three different topics um, in this round. Uh, so we've got a question from Stan. Is the Uber decision from the courts this week a starting point for challenging anti-trade unionism? Um, so people will no doubt have seen the headlines about um, Uber drivers being given worker status. So I think, uh, you know, a very significant judgment. Uh, another question, Keir's speech this week said little on the climate. How can we push the Green New Deal ahead of COP26 later this year. And then finally in this round from Kaylin, how can we encourage good political education? It gives strength and is inspiring. And certainly as someone who benefited from trade union political education, I, I agree, it stays with you for the rest of your life um, and is very important. Uh, so Steve, would you like to pick up on any or all of those? Can we swap and let, let Matt go first? <laughs> Or do you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, thanks, Ruth, and there's two quite diverse questions. Um, I'm going to go from the last one backwards. Um, political education, I think I mentioned this in my speech, I think um, that is a really important point. And I think sometimes if we look at what, if we were to look at mistakes that we collectively made as a left in the years of Corbyn leadership, which obviously took everyone a bit by surprise, I think it'd be fair to say, like... Uh, I mean, I was working on the Diane for London mayor candidate campaign in 2015, Dianamics campaign. I remember like the return started coming in on how the new registered supporters were voting. And in that section, we were like ahead, um, which wasn't what we were sort of the position we were expecting to be in. And obviously that was reflected much more in the national thing with Jeremy. Um, so it did take a lot of people by surprise. But I think if we look at things that we maybe could have done better on, um, then I think political education was one of them. Um, I think that we didn't get a rise up going as an, an, only an annual thing at that point in 2018. Um, the TWT was a very good event, but it was like very much something alongside conference and that. And then there were some regional ones later on. And I think also we sometimes weren't ambitious enough in the, the ideas we were discussing. I think we were getting a bit bogged down in, in some particular topics, but not discussing the history and the theory and the kind of things that Steve was mentioning that reading groups could discuss. I think we didn't do enough of that. I think it's something we've learned. So I think the political education is really important. And obviously most people on this call I think would have would have been involved with a rise event because we're sort of linked organizations that really do follow a rise and other projects on that. Um on the Green New Deal and Climate and the speech the other day, I thought what was missing, this is just a personal opinion, what was missing from the speech wasn't so much his critique of the Tories, which I thought was was strong and perhaps stronger than you might expect, and not the formal economics around this austerity and investment, which if you look at it like as a sort of formal bit of paper in front of you were better than the, the economic towards the end of the Ed Miliband years, for example. Um, it was a sort of lack of a vision of something better, a lack of a vision, what we would call a socialist vision. And I think that's where the left, not only on policy details, has to fill in the gap, but also has to promote that vision. I mean, a Green New Deal, um, and I do personally prefer the phrase Green New Deal to Green Deal Revolution, I think because I think it's a global movement and we want to assert ourselves as part of the global movement system here in Britain. Um, 
I think that was something that was lacking that speech. I think it's something that we need to be building on as well. Like we had amazing work. We had a brilliant minister, shadow minister on that in Rebecca Long Bailey, and we made great progress at party conference motion last year and that the FBU and others promoted and so on. But I think that's sort of something that needs to be keep driving. So it's just put the work of Labour, Green New Deal and other groups and also make sure that we integrate it more. And this is something we all need to let into our own discussions and things as well. Um, because we need to, something that I think we need to be really turning to. And I think the next Labour Assembly event on the budget and the one that we're going to announce shortly, joint with no holding back about this issue specifically, is jobs and full employment and the right to a job. And I think that has to be, that's like at the centre of the plan, but it needs to be even more at the centre of what we're doing because we're already in an unemployment crisis. It's going to get a lot worse. And I think that could Green New Deal is an integral part of us of arguing for solutions to that unemployment crisis. Um, finally, on trade unionism, I think that's a really important discussion. Um, I think like when we discuss about why socialists been Labour Party, we often mention a trade union link. Um, but we don't discuss it more than that. And I think there's a few different things we can discuss. One is making that link a reality and alive in your area, if you can. Like in our area, we still have a, before the AGM, we have a union hub where all the union delegates agree who is supporting for the union office. And that's that. That's who the two low officers isn't decided by the delegates. It's decided by the trade union delegates. And we decide our, collectively our policies on other things and try to stick to them. Um, I don't think that's very common anymore, but I think that is an example of a living collective link of trade unions. We should be trying to, if in areas where the left still runs the CLP or has influence CLP, we should be trying to get people not just to affiliate, but actually that the affiliation to mean more than just using votes for that reason when they want to. And I also think the left, you know, we're just saying that we shouldn't abandon the struggle in the Labour Party. Um, and we don't often hear, you do hear it occasionally, we don't often hear people say, we should form a new trade union because our trade union is reactionary. You do hear it on occasion. It's not very much. Also, there is a struggle inside trade unions and people should be open about that and should... Trade unions are dynamic things. Like the, the rise of the left and the awkward squad prior to around the same time as Blair was leader definitely influenced the movements that then came later with the shift to the left in 2010 and then further so in 2015. The rise of leaders like Tony Woodley uh, at the TNG. Um, and, you know, so on, the FBU, two left-wing leaders in their own FBU and so on, very much um, influenced that. So we should be encouraging people to get active in their trade union and arguing for democracy and the pushing of younger people and new leaders to the surface. And that sort of brings me to my last point, which is I think something we as Labour Outlook need to do and we all need to do is we have this young Labour, that the left won the elections in, we have all these younger people have joined the party. And we on the left, I think, need to have a bit of self-criticism and be putting those people much more in the forefront of our events, of our campaigns and things and listening to what they want to be campaigning. I think on Labour Outlook, we are starting to do that. We have some regular contributors who are chairs of Labour clubs and things. I think that's something that we really need to do. And that's something that will make the passion around the issues around Green New Deal more real as well. Just a couple of, of quick ad, added points. I won't, I won't say much on the political education other than on the union side of it, which... I've noticed there's a question going through the Q&A um, from somebody saying uh, unions are affiliated to the Labour Party, but it's very difficult to get union members actually engaged with the Labour Party. And that's historically been a, been a big problem. Um, you know, you've got individual membership of the Labour Party and people are in their wards and constituencies. Um, and, and union activists have got their politics from being active in the union. And I, I, know, I know that uh, I lived in Sheffield for 20 years. And that was very much the case in, in, in Sheffield. That there was a lot of politics and Labour Party politics done through the unions. Um, and if you went to a shop steward's quarterly meeting, I worked in the steel industry for about three years and, and I'd go to the shop steward's uh, quarterly meetings. That was probably one of the best debates, political debates and discussions I would have um, anywhere uh, in a sort of monthly or two monthly cycle of meetings in, in that shop stewards quarterly. Um, so I think it's important that we, we uh, see the unions as being the Labour Party, um, if you like, and, and, that, and that we, through our union activity, uh, try and create uh, opportunities for political debate, political education and so on to, to raise the level of understanding uh, within the unions uh, about the kind of, uh, about the big issues, socialism obviously, but all these other issues as well. Um, on the question of the Green New Deal, um, uh, the, 
you know, I, I think it does kind of bring everything together. You know, it brings the climate crisis together. It brings the jobs crisis together. It brings the question of investment together, regional issues and so on. Um, we've seen with COVID the, uh, the rundown of Britain's manufacturing base meant that we had to import lots of stuff that was desperately needed, like PPE stuff and so on, that was desperately needed uh, for uh, uh, fighting the pandemic. Uh, our industrial base has been destroyed through neoliberalism in a much bigger way than in any developed capitalist country. Uh, so I think the Green New Deal is, a, is, is both a, you know, a climate uh, thing and a, an, an economic strategy all in one. And I think it's absolutely brilliant because of that. But the other thing I'd say that's linked to that is that I know that in the branch I was previously in, I just transferred, uh, in Cardiff, one of the guys who's really pushing the Green New Deal and was very big on it was actually someone you would call, you might in the past have called a Blairite. And so I think that you, it's important with these kind of uh, things that you don't sort of label people and cut yourself off from them. Um, just because somebody did support Keir Starmer or somebody does still support Keir Starmer doesn't mean to say they can't be very good on some issues and we need to bring people along with us and we're in the business of changing people's minds not creating barriers uh, between ourselves and other people so and I think the Green New Deal is a particularly strong way of doing that on the Uber thing I mean what can you say I think that's a big opportunity now uh, for the unions to go out and really organise uh, around that and try and win with other um, casual workers in the gig economy, um, uh, proper employment rights. And, um, and, and I know that unions are doing that. I know it's hard to organise those, those kind of workers, uh, but they're now a big section of the working class and it's important that it, uh, it, it happens. And I, I think that, that gives a really good uh, lever to pull. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Um, again, but uh, thanks to you and Matt, some very interesting answers. And I think we are seeing some, it is difficult and it requires different ways of organising, but I've been really interested in the way in my own union, for example, some of the work with hospitality workers uh, who've been very badly affected by COVID uh, mm -hmm. has been picked up and real campaigns have been launched. And I think um, we've also seen a rise in kind of local trades council activity and quite often I think they met they had a structure they weren't necessarily incredibly active uh, and I think we're now seeing Covid is bringing people together certainly the work the NEU was doing uh, did did bring people together because everyone cares about everyone cares about the community's children it doesn't matter whether you're a parent or not and everyone cares about safety in their area so I think those opportunities to do joint campaigning and organising are really important. Thank you very much. I've got um, I've got some more questions for you. And so uh, moving on to some quite different topics, really. Uh, a number of people are raising whether now's the time to consider PR rather than first past the post. So interested to have your thoughts on that. Then the very important May elections are coming shortly. So that's Wales, Scotland and the mayors um, and uh, in some areas, a number of councillors. How should the left respond if Labour does badly? And I think that's quite an interesting question. I think Steve's point about we need to build alliances with people we may not agree with on everything. And I think nobody wants to go to meetings where everyone moans at each other all the time. So what, what is the right response? How do we move on if results aren't good? Will this show here that his strategy is failing? Uh, and then there's a number of points being raised specifically about the role of the media. Um, and I think we would all know that um, they were incredibly hostile to Jeremy and there's been quite a lot of academic research that would back that up. Uh, but they're still hostile to Jeremy and to the left more broadly and not holding the government to account. And I was looking at Twitter before today uh, and the whole stuff about the way in which contracts have been awarded is not even making major news uh, when it's a you know, it, I would have said some decades ago that would have led to resignations and the whole government's position being um, in question. How does the left build independent voices? And I know Steve's already spoken a bit about that. And then the final uh, one, 
is how do we not just defend democracy in the party as, as it is under attack from party officers, but how do we try and still make sure that some of the strengthening of party democracy from the democracy reviews takes place? Uh, and I think Matt's referred to there's um, some of the structures around women, around uh, black members and BAME structures. There's quite a lot there. So uh, would you like to go first, Steve? Or okay. Um, let me see. Quite a lot to go out there. Uh, on proportional representation, um, I, I may be a little bit of a dinosaur here, but what I worry about is that uh, PR... Uh, makes it harder to get a Labour government. I mean, we saw what happened uh, in the Brexit negotiations with the uh, small centrist parties uh, in September uh, 2019, where they wanted to decide, they didn't want the leader of the biggest party, i.e. Jeremy Corbyn, to be prime minister of a coalition government. They wanted to decide who, who the leader was. Now, imagine a situation where the Labour Party gets, for, say, 44% of the vote in a PR system, and two or three small parties led by, say, Chukar Amuna and um, I don't know who. Um, what's her, I've already forgotten her name, the Liberal Democrat leader who, at the time of the 2019. What was her name? Joe. Oh, so Joe Swinson. Joe Swinson. Thank you very much. Sorry, senior moment. Um, so you can imagine a situation where you've got sort of Joe Swinson and Chukar Amuna vetoing who the Labour Party, the biggest party, wants to have as Prime Minister in that kind of situation. The trouble with proportional representation is it gives a disproportionate amount of power, potentially, to quite small parties. And we've seen this in, uh, in, in European situations. So I'm, I'm still a believer that our best hope for, for being able to achieve change through a parliamentary democracy is, is through Labour governments. And the best way of getting Labour governments is, frankly, the first-past-the-post uh, system. Um, on the question of the elections, I think if you want to criticise uh, Keir Starmer and the party leadership after the elections, you've got to do it from the moral high ground. And the only way you can do it from the moral high ground is by being part of the campaign. Now, you know, I understand that in some situations, people might feel unmotivated to do that. As it happens here, I'm in a fortunate position, but we've got a very good candidate. No chance of winning in Montgomeryshire, but we've got a very good candidate. Um, and I'm also um, very happy that, you know, Mark Drakeford, who's leader of the Labour Party in Wales, is a very good leader of the Labour Party in Wales. I've got a lot of respect for Mark Drakeford, and he was supported by the left to be the leader of the Labour Party uh, in Wales. So, relatively fortunate position here in uh, here in Wales. But I, I accept the fact that it might feel a bit different in other parts of the country. But nonetheless, I think if afterwards you're going to to uh, want to be in a position to criticise, not in a carping petty way, but in a in a serious way then you're, you're, far, you're going to be in a far stronger position to do it if you've been seen to participate and support the uh, campaign. In terms of the role of the media, I mean, what can you say? I mean, I, it's, it, I feel as if it's got worse and worse and worse, and it's never been good. So as socialists, we've just got to kind of price that into everything we do, that, that, that the media is going to be uh, either hostile or simply not cover things at all that are... Uh, like, like you were saying about the, uh, the the High Court ruling yesterday on the on the contracts. I mean, that was a front page lead by any standards. Um, you know, I, I I used to work as a journalist, and that would have been a front page lead for me, without without question. Um, but uh, but it's a balance, isn't it? We've got to try and utilise the opportunities that there are in the mainstream media, particularly through broadcast, because I think on radio and, and, and TV, there are, there are still opportunities for the left to get in on uh, discussions, to get on panels and so on. Not as much as there was when Corbyn was leader, um, because I've noticed with myself that the number of invitations I'm getting has dropped dramatically since he, since he ceased to be leader. But, um, but still, there are opportunities. But the most important thing of all is to build our alternative media uh, without question. Um, and on the point about defending democracy, I, I mean, I, I really think that um, 
it's important to keep the argument going. I mean, there's a whole number of aspects of this, which I think Matt may be more kind of familiar with the detail than I am, but certainly on the question of selection, um, the idea that someone gets nominated uh, to be uh, a Labour candidate and, and, and becomes an MP and is there basically for life, I think is indefensible. And if in the United States, you can have a situation where in Congress, you only have two year terms and every two years someone comes up for reselection, then what, why not here? And I think we need to keep bashing away at that argument because if we want to have uh, a progressive transformative Labour government, then we really have to change the Parliamentary Labour Party and it's, it's important that we win that argument. And I think particularly winning it in the unions because I think the unions will have a big influence on that at conference when the debates about the constitution and democracy take place. Great, thank you very much indeed. Matt. Thanks, uh, yeah, great questions again in such a range and so many great questions coming in. And thanks to the just two volunteers who are trying to comment and reply to them. It's a new thing for us, um, but I noticed that there's, a, they've answered 134 questions, that's pretty pretty big numbers of questions um, being referred or discussed. Um, and this is a big range of topics. Um, in the order they were taking, just very quickly on some of them, I personally still support first past the post. Um, I'm not sort of one of these people who gets very passionate about it like some people do. Um, but I think at the moment that seems the most likely way to get a Labour government to me, so I would be for it. I also think in the current internal party regime, a move to like a list-based system would could be used to purge left MPs. And we had that situation in the late 90s when the Euro Parliament was changed, like with loads of MEPs. When you used to get campaign group news every month, it's a list of all the campaign group MPs and MEPs. And then they made the European elections under Blair, it was a list system for PR. And there was one month where like about 10 names just dropped off because they were either all deselected or put so low down the PR list in their region that they didn't get elected. And um, so I would be worried in the current context about that happening again. But I do think the sort of mood for it you get about electoral reform often reflects a quite progressive feeling, which is that the political system simply isn't working. People don't feel represented and so on. So I don't think you can sort of be dismissive of it at all and the issues around it. And I think also we shouldn't, confuse democratisation and struggle for constitutional reform just with electoral reform. Like, um, for example, devolution was very progressive, I think. Um, and we should be looking at other democracies, like more power in regions, more power to the mayors that exist, um, making local government work and properly funded and stuff. I, we shouldn't ignore questions of constitutional democracy, like the ridiculousness of the House of Lords. For example. Um, on the elections, I agree with what Steve said, the upcoming elections. Um, I think we also should be again, argue against them being cancelled. Um, I think I think that's just my personal view, but I think a further delay of the London elections would be. I think it's a bit like it feels a bit like it's always just someone picking in London, so they keep delaying them. It's possible to have elections. So Biden um, was elected in these circumstances, um, but also I think it, the Welsh elections are very important. I think the Welsh Labour administration is different. It's the kind of reforming administration that a lot of Labour members would like to see and want to see. So it's very important to get him back in. Um, and of course, Scotland, there's been a leadership contest, which has been covered on Labour Outlook going on. And we'll see how that goes. But there's important campaigns going on and the Welsh Labour grassroots and the Scottish campaign for socialism both doing great work. Um, on the media, I don't have much to add at all. Steve is definitely more of an expert in this area than me. I think um, what we have to do is understand the importance of our own media, social media and so on build it but also understand the limitations of it in terms of who we're reaching because that's something that organizes a lot of events and the website and so on you can just look at big numbers that you see on facebook and think wow you know we've, we've nailed it you know, millions of people who are tuning in and agreeing with us and that would be great if it was true but that isn't actually what those numbers fully represent so i think whilst we need to keep building it keep sharing be very wary of these um limitations on facebook and twitter as well that can be used against the left like I know the SWP aren't everyone's cup of tea, but the fact that Facebook just went on sort of a long purge of the SWP's Facebook accounts, um, I think was very worrying and actually reflected things going on in the government as well about restricting freedom of speech. We sort of think about you shouldn't have anti-capitalist materials used in schools. We've seen ELM and others called extremist movements. So we need to keep an eye on that issue in social media as well. Obviously, in terms of Labour Outlook and what we're doing, our numbers have been, we've been going for about a year and a three months, I think. Our numbers are very steady up but it is steady and any occasional thing 
it blows through. So I think what we need to look at is why do some issues really you know, grab people's imagination and try and do that. And I do think it's important that like Tribune, the Morning Star and Labour Outlook are supported. I don't think we can get our message through enough just by the tweets and little videos and all these things which are so important. We do actually need more discussion and analysis as well. So I think it's important to keep that going, even though sometimes it's like it can feel a bit of a slog. Um, and then in terms of democracy, I think there's been a lot of comments and questions in the chat on this. It's very important. Um, I think something that I would like to raise, and I don't know if it's been raised elsewhere, is I think we should be wary of conference getting cancelled altogether again this year. I know there is a discussion going on about a new recall conference and some CLPs are passing that. Um, and I think if you go on Don't Leave Organise, you can find more information about that. Um, but also we need to make sure that they don't, we didn't have a conference last year. We don't want to, conferences can be done online. We don't want there to not be a conference. It's good the women's conference should go ahead online and we want the annual conference to go ahead online. Um, and the point that was mentioned there in the question and in the chat about the democracy review, obviously that's something that probably wasn't, didn't go as far as an officer would like, and also wasn't a completed process. So we need to really defend that in terms of the self organization And I think the left needs to be clear on this. The left needs to full stop support black or self organization, LGBT self organization, disabled people self organization against the oppression they face. And that means genuine structures in the Labour Party. Um, it's not divisive, it's the opposite. It's the only way to bring about unity. Socialist politics is nothing of it, isn't about people's liberation as well. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, it's amazing to have had so many questions in and it's great um, that we've got such a big audience and people are being so um, engaged. Uh, we're about to come to our last round of questions. So if Steve and Matt also want to make any concluding remarks at that point, that would be brilliant. Um, and I'd just like to thank everyone uh, for taking part this afternoon. Um, I know lots of people are spending a lot of time on Zoom at the moment, and so it can feel a challenge at a weekend to get involved in something else. But I've, I found the conversation really, really interesting and quite inspiring. And we, we do need to remind ourselves how important it is to uh, be involved, to be campaigning, to take part um, and to ensure that we're building a movement for change. And um, if you can make a donation, that would be brilliant. The links are in the chat. And as Amy said earlier, uh, there is a real cost to putting events on online and in it would enable Labour Outlook to increase its web presence and put on more events. And I think as Matt has said, you can't cover everything in a tweet. There is a real need on the left to have these more in-depth conversations and for us to develop um, our thinking and, uh, you know, think about new ways of doing things. Um, just again, I think there's a plug in the uh, chat, but the next discussion uh, being put on is why socialists are anti-imperialists with Andrew Murray, who's one of the founders of Stop the War and is the chief of staff for Unite the Union. Uh, and was an advisor to Jeremy Corbyn, and that's taking place on April the 24th at two o'clock. Uh, please do join us then. Make, follow, make sure that you follow Labour Outlook on Twitter and on Facebook, and they're both at Labour Outlook, uh, to keep up to date with what's happening. Um, thank you to the volunteers who I know have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, um, and huge thanks to both our speakers who've been really, really fascinating, and to Amy as well. So just moving to the last questions, these take us really into a sort of more internationalist perspective. Uh, Jeremy's leadership offered a new direction on foreign, foreign policy. How do we defend and embed an anti-war agenda under Kia? And then second question, which is the final one, what are the possibilities and learning from Bernie Sanders and the progressives uh, and what they've been doing in the States? And what lessons are there from them for us here in Britain? Um, and then obviously, if there were any final remarks you wanted to make. Uh, so, Steve, if I can move to you. Oh, sorry, and you're sorry. muted. <laughs> yes, I was mute. I muted myself. Um, can I just say on the on the media question uh, just now that one thing I forgot to mention, which I'll I'll, I'll be cheeky and, and, and just mention now is, I don't think we should ever underestimate the kind of local and regional press and the opportunities that, that they can provide, that that level of media can provide because you're more likely, uh, there's less control at that level 
um, and journalists are closer to their uh, their communities. And uh, certainly in my experience, I've worked in local and regional media, and I know a lot of people who do. Uh, you're more likely to get stuff in than than you will do. The national media, the, particularly the national newspapers, are very very tightly controlled. Uh, so so never underestimate uh, never underestimate that, and try and take advantage of it. Um, on on the um, anti-war agenda. I mean, this is this is a very big question, but I, I do think, as I said earlier, we've got to step up our uh, efforts uh, to build the peace movement again, because I think the situation has once again become very dangerous. So I think there's two fronts to this. One is the uh, the, the issue of uh, arms build up uh, between. The United States, NATO on the one hand, and China and Russia on the other. Um, at the moment, I mean, the, 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 it's very one-sided. The, uh, the the military power of the United States is vastly superior to the um, to the power of China. But what what the United States wants to do effectively is encircle China um, in much the same way as during the Cold War. The strategy was to try and encircle uh, the Soviet Union, um, and. It, it, I, I think we need on that issue to highlight the fact that nobody can win a nuclear war. We need to revive the arguments about uh, a nuclear winter, um, which is now, I think, scientifically accepted that, you know, the use of nuclear weapons would uh, uh, tip the world into a, a disastrous climate change of a different kind to the one that we've been talking about and worrying about uh, at the moment. Um, and alongside that, I think we need to. Uh, I, I think we need to highlight how these regime change wars that we've seen uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Libya, particularly, and, and the sort of low intensity warfare, if you like, ar around the, the Syrian uh, regime change war, and not not the kind of overt uh, um, war that we saw with Iraq and uh, uh, Libya, how utterly disastrous they've been on so many levels. I mean, you know, they've created a huge global um, migration crisis of, you know, millions of people who have uh, been uh, turned into refugees. They've obviously uh, made us less secure uh, by... Uh, increasing tensions, increasing resentment of the West. Uh, they haven't even been successful in their own terms. I mean, the United States has been in Afghanistan now for 25 years and is probably going to uh, end up ceding power to the Taliban uh, after all this time, you know, on all these deaths. Um, so, you know, we've got to make those arguments against uh, regime change wars. Um, it's very difficult to read what's going on with Biden, I think. Um, most of it, the advisors he's appointed are Obama era hawks uh, who aren't uh, uh, going to change uh, their spots, I don't think. But having said that, you know, Biden has done one or two uh, positive things. But the thrust of what he's doing at the moment is, uh, is to try and reassert American global leadership, um, but in a sort of you know, charm offensive rather than uh, in a particularly aggressive way at this stage. But I, th I, you know, I think it's potentially quite uh, dangerous if the United States go on a more aggressive position towards China. Um, if we don't solve some of the problems of these, the legacy of these regime change wars, or actually get American troops out of Afghanistan, get American troops out of Syria, because they're actually in Syria, they they shouldn't be, and. Uh, you know, it's a breach of international law, but they're there. Um, so, so there's a lot to do and a lot of arguments to make, uh, but we, uh, but we have to do it, and uh, uh, we need to, you know, work with people in CND and work with people in the trade union movement to do that. On the question of uh, Bernie Sanders, I mean, there's so many aspects to this. I'm, uh, I'm a very big fan of Bernie Sanders, and I think that the the shrewdest and most far-sighted thing that Bernie Sanders has done. Is, is this point I made earlier about seeing his presidential campaigns as being all about building a movement and leaving that legacy 
of grassroots organization. And I, I read I read the other day that progressives in the um, Michigan uh, State Democratic Party have now taken control of the state of Michigan. So you're seeing the Democratic Party moving step by step in different st states towards the left. You're seeing the Democratic Socialists of America building uh, organization now with 85,000 members, having had only 5,000 members uh, a, a, a few years ago. Um, so I think it's all about that organizing for change um, and supporting, uh, you know, where we where we can get left candidates nominated for parliamentary seats and where we can get them nominated for mayoral contests and so on. You know, mobilizing support to get them chosen, mobilizing support to get them elected. Uh, and, and building a new leadership in, in the political structures of the country uh, and building a mass movement underneath them. Uh, that's, that's what Sanders has been all about. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a long way to go in the States. Let's not overestimate it. But, but in my lifetime, I've never known socialism have so much sort of explicit support and be talked about so much as it is now in the United States. Uh, and I go there a lot. I mean, I haven't done it in the last 12 months, but I, I go there usually two or three times a year. And it's amazing for me to see that. And it's very encouraging, uh, but still a long way to go, uh, just as we've still got, you know, a lot to do here. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think there's a lot we can draw from it uh, on those kind of levels. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Um, a lot, I think, for us to learn and to think about how we take those lessons here. Um, Matt. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, on the last point, I sort of, on Sanders, I'll leave that mainly to Steve, but something that I think is of interest and incredibly significant is the rise of the squad and the kind of rise of black women leaders on the left in the States. And that's something I think we also see here with, you know, Sarah Sultana, Afsana Begum, Bel Rabira Adi. Um, I think that's really positive and, you know, trailblazed here by Diane, obviously, all those years ago, but so important. Um, in terms of other things, just to say, do the plug. If I know that people already mentioned this, but please do donate if you can. It's all country what Labour Outlook and things like Arise do. But if we don't get donations, we can't have the Zoom webinar. We can't have Restream, which enables us to send this here and everywhere on the internet and so on. So please do give £10 or what you can. In terms of the points around anti-war, politics I think this is really important and one of the reasons that we actually founded Arise was because we felt that in the Labour left there was a under Jeremy there wasn't enough being done to defend the politics of Jeremy's international politics if you actually look at what happens with that opinion polling shows that anti-war politics and Jeremy's international opinions actually chime a lot with majority public opinion but they were also the bits that were most significantly attacked again and again in the establishment in the media and with, by the right wing within the party like people might remember the ridiculous fuss in the media in the party about um, Jeremy Corbyn going to stop the War Coalition Christmas dinner, which kind of became a media story for like a number of weeks. And um, and one Blairite faction sent out press release saying Labour had stooped to a new low by Jeremy Corbyn going to this dinner in this Turkish restaurant in Waterloo. Um, presumably killing a million Iraqis was nothing compared with going to this unsavoury dinner. But there's a lot of good stuff being done on this. There's a pamphlet by the Stop the War Coalition from Andrew Murray and Lindsay German um, no Return to Blair Wars, which is a critique of this sort of new Cold War pan advocacy of the Britain Labour current, um, which I think is well worth reading. There's the Arise event 10 years on from the war in Libya, which is one of also 20 years on, of course, for the war on terror this year, um, which people, Jeremy, that people should go to and people should support CND, as Steve mentioned, and also to stop the war coalition. It's quite impressive and amazing to have had a sort of permanent anti-war and anti-imperialist coalition go for 20 years. That's quite a unique and a brilliant thing to achieve. So that's very important to keep that going, keep that going in your areas as well. Um, and I agree that the sort of base that policy, international policy has to be opposing more wars of intervention, both the explicit and obvious ones, but also the ones through arms, for example, like but arming Saudi for the war in Yemen. Um, also, I think it means standing with the Palestinians for their right to resist occupation and other similar struggles. And I also think it's important for us to look at the left in Latin America, which obviously was something we did a lot at one stage, and then it looked like it was kind of on the retreat, um, as perhaps most symbolised by the coup in Bolivia. But actually, if you look at things now, you've had the reversal of the coup in Bolivia and the left back in power. You've had the failure of Trump's regime change efforts in Nicaragua, Venezuela and Cuba through sanctions. 
hitting that agenda hasn't worked. You've got massive resistance in against Bolsonaro in Brazil, and maybe after Trump, Bolsonaro will be next. The left won the first round in the elections in Ecuador again, won the referendum in Chile, Argentina, things are moving forward on a number of fronts, which is fortune. Legislation very progressive introduced by a government which the US didn't want, Trump didn't want. Uh, Mexico, you obviously had the left first win for so long. So that's like, I think that's really positive. And that shows you the struggles like we're talking about. You don't just win and lose. It doesn't work like that. You have defeats, you have victories, you have hard times and good times, but the struggle continue. And I think as Steve says, we also need to say no to a new Cold War with China. Um, obviously the thing that I think, if you were looking at Biden's following policy, that's where the, that and things like Venezuela, there doesn't seem to be much. I think where there is a shift, it's so important to emphasize and rip open that contradiction. But, but also it's important to be honest where there isn't one. Um, so that's all for me really, just to say in terms of closing remarks, I thought this was a really useful discussion I think it was great to have this sort of explicit discussion about socialism and labour rather than have it on Twitter or whatever, like to have a proper discussion. Um, and also, I just think we should all, something Steve said really struck me, I think we should all be like educating ourselves and each other, like both through our activity and movements in the party, but also reading history and theory and things. Because I think we're in for a big few years of seismic shocks and crises and we need to be ready to take our struggle forward. And finally, just a big thanks to the volunteers, Steve and Ruth. Thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you'll uh, join us for future events. Thank you. Thank you.